Chapter 4. The Modular Architecture of Capital. In this chapter, we develop our modular framework by building upon the intersections between the Marxian theory of capital, critical realism, and the Aristotelian fourfold causation theory previously explored. With reference to Harvey's formulation of capital is value in motion and boundless accumulation, we posit that capital is actually fetish value in destructive operation built upon the boundless eradication of true value and functioning as negative value by eradicating the capacities of organized life for self-sustaining and thriving. Capital is thus an expansionist value regime inherently prone to conflict and struggles, but its relationship with its counter-movements that emerge out of its self-generated crises is not simply antagonistic. Capital. A modular, infra-processual conception. Decommonization begins with what we redefine as the perversion of the indispensable commoning sources of true value into their reified forms, i.e., reification, and finally into capital, see figure 4.1. The reification infraprocess is complemented by the fetishization and appropriation infraprocess and moderated, and thus relatively stabilized, by the civilizing meta-mechanisms. The reification infraprocess makes appropriation and accumulation of extracted fetish value in its tangible forms possible. Different types or instances of capital are constructed through the combination of various modes of appropriation of its reified social forms under the fetishization infraprocess, see figure 4.1 in table 4.1. The models developed here operate at the level of infraprocesses for the purpose of analytical simplification. For example, the process of commodification, while a meta-process in relation to reification, is not included in the model. This is because commodification is not the only process necessitated by reification, and capital does not solely rely on commodification. The role of commodification can be analyzed through the application of the model in contextualized cases. The concept of commodification is closely tied to exchange value and may neglect the use value of commodified items as well as the social and ecological value of uncommodified entities. For instance, Analyses that center around commodification often overlook the value of social and community services that are not traditionally exchanged in the market but are essential for both the well-being of society and the accumulation of capital. Moreover, commodification-centered analyses fail to capture how capital uses non-market mechanisms, such as state subsidies, intellectual property rights, or monopolies, to extract value, giving capitalists a considerable advantage in the market. By starting from a deeper level, i.e., the infra-process, our theory can account for how capital transforms social and ecological relations into abstract forms of value. Thus, the scope of analysis is extended beyond the inner organization of capital, where the commodification of labor and commodification through labor, and the embedding of labor into the commodity, take place. The reification infra-process under capitalism, which is central to decommunization, objectifies the fundamental commons by depriving them of their inherent transformative capacities and actual subjectivities as active sources of true value. This allows for their appropriation and the extraction of fetish value. Reification, as the term implies, thingification, is about the conversion of subjects to objects by taking away their agency and meaning. This includes a broad range of processes, such as the objectification of, more than, human powers for creativity and livability, to what is artificially constructed as labor and nature under capital. It is this mechanism at the level of the deep real that submits these commoning sources of value to socioeconomic processes at the level of the actual, such as commodification, commercialization, and financialization within the sphere of capital. Note that this is a broader concept than the narrower notion of reification attributed to production relations in the Marxist tradition, which is closely tied to, and even equivocally equated with, fetishism and alienation. Reification here happens outside the inner structure of productive capital as part of the decommonizing infra-process. Figure 4.1 portrays capital as the product and infra-process of decommonizing the fundamental commoning sources of value and perverting them into sources of fetish value, to fuel the inner workings of capital. Fetish value is a new entity with an essence different from the essence of true value. The motion of fetish value within the inner organization of capital is of a non-essential nature, Tombasos, 2020, meaning the inner motion is only a transformation of the forms of appearance from one diversity to another. The reification of fundamental commons of life is an infra-process through which a Sadrian substantive motion takes place, a transmutation in the essence of an entity, here the fundamental commons. 
the commoning nature of the sources of true value becomes converted into an, essentially, different nature that functions like an object alienated from its original agency and meaning, which can only be fully realized in the commonest state of being. This is an ontological shift or perversion that requires its own new epistemology to underpin the modern sciences and technologies that treat nature as the object of thought and action. Under such a science as ideology, Selicates and Jeggy, 2017, fundamental sources of livability are ideologically reconstructed as the riches gifts of nature through reification, to be exploited through the capitalist processes of extracting value that are built upon such an alienating instrumentalist epistemological setting. The objectification of the subject is incomplete without placing it under the control of an object that is rendered a fetish subjectivity, hence fetishization and appropriation. Such a conversion of subject to object is always complemented with the conversion of object to subject, thus the inversion of subject and object, which we alternatively call abstraction. The fetishizing infra process works to enhance the sustainability of socio-ecological relations, through which capital is assigned irrational but legitimate incorporeal values. In this way, the expansion of capital gains roots in the human psyche as the inevitable or unrivaled source of value. Capital as fetish value now gains the status of a telos, a final cause in its own inner structure of reproduction. External to capital's inner dynamics, capitalist value complexes are normalized, moralized, and even become sources of fetishistic identity formation. They become entangled with modern versions of patriarchal, ethnocentric, anthropocentric, and colonialist value complexes, reinventing them and being reinvented by them. This is how political cultural hegemony is created, leading to more concentration of power in the de-democratization of social institutions in the broader capitalist formation. Some key meta-mechanisms that work under this infra-process are modern anthropomorphizing, psychologizing, and sanctifying. Consider the example of, more than, human creativity as the efficient cause of true value and its perversion into labor as a commodity under capital, Hosseini, 2022b. The meta-mechanisms of fetishization, including anthropomorphizing, psychologizing, and sanctifying, can play a significant role in this perversion, decommonization infra-process. For instance, psychologizing human creativity by framing it as an innate, individualistic talent or gift, instead of a collective social practice developed and nurtured within a community enables the commodification of creativity by reducing it to a personal attribute that can be bought and sold on the labor market. Sanctifying mechanisms can create hierarchies of talent that reflect market values, making certain forms of creative expression seem more valuable or prestigious than others. Anthropomorphizing mechanisms can encourage the development of artificial intelligence and other technologies that seek to replicate and replace human labor, contributing to the decommonization of human creativity. Fetishization, which makes reification more than objectification, is an infra-process through which value generated under capital, i.e., fetish value, takes on the status of a subject, being not only sold to both value makers and takers as true value through false consciousness but more importantly making them existentially dependent on it as a regulator of their social and ecological relations. This dependence is so insidious that it can blind many struggles over the redistribution of fetish value, in the form of income and wealth generated through capitalist relations, to the lost or perverted potentialities for the generation of true value. These struggles, as a result, lose their capacity to implant and pursue final causes alternative to capital. By the term appropriation, we mean something deeper than dispossession or expropriation. It chiefly regards transforming common care or stewardship, where everyone is responsible for one another, into hierarchical control that delimits the purpose of the value generation process. This process can take various forms, such as primitive enclosures or modern land grabbing, or more abstract, sophisticated methods of controlling the flow of information that is essential for value production. For example, in a capitalist factory, the appropriation of the fruits of labor is only possible if labor power is exchanged as a commodity, secondary abstraction, as we call it here, as theorized by Marx, and if labor is already created from the decommonization of human creative power, which we call, primary abstraction. 1. However, appropriation does not need to happen after reification is done. These infra-processes are intertwined, disassociating human creative power from its commonest embeddedness in the life domain, contributing to the great rift as a prerequisite for its alienation from the rest of the domain, and thus its objectification into labor power as a commodity. 
political forces and struggles play a decisive role in this process. While an old ruling class may decline, and a new one may emerge, what happens underneath the rise and fall of ruling classes and their internal compositions is the reinvention of power structures. Hierarchies, such as patriarchal, racial, and anthropocentric, continue to reinvent themselves in a dialectical relationship with the evolutionary reinventions of the modes of extracting and appropriating value. New mechanisms are invented to make the appropriation of value more efficient. Appropriation determines power and is determined by power. In the capitalist economic realm, appropriation mechanisms include legal and policy procedures that regulate access, ownership, and redistribution. These include property rights, corporatization, taxation, and privatization, as well as those that legalize, legitimize, and regulate risk-taking, rent-seeking, profiting, seizing, enclosure, and all mechanisms developed to sustain control over the flows of capital and its accumulation in favor of capitalist classes. These mechanisms are subject to intra-class and inter-class conflicts and are gendered and racialized, thus requiring civilizing mechanisms to maintain systemic order, as mostly implemented by the state and the elite segments of civil society. Financial interest in capitalist societies is a mechanism for appropriating the future-oriented risk-taking behaviors rooted in human prefigurative power, already reified into exchangeable commitments, Christopher's, 2016. Social media platforms are new tools for appropriating the effective activities of millions of socially alienated internet users, reified in data form, who seek companionship to compensate for the convivial relationships lost to the imperatives of living in estrangement. Civilizing meta-mechanisms make up the system-wide civilizing meta-process, which functions as a negative feedback loop to save the system from excessive disequilibrium and the escalation of chaos caused by excessive reification. Progressive redistributive mechanisms, such as taxation, subsidization, social welfare provision, environmental conservation, basic incomes, full employment, corporate long-termism, co-option of dissent, often in the form of participation, production of common goods, and building pseudo-commons, that give a false sense of communality to their participants and often are decommonized to extract value out of their free interactions, are part of such mechanisms. Civilizing mechanisms can also include regressive measures such as the regulation of immigration, fortification of surveillance, and adoption of ethnocentric majoritarian policies. These mechanisms, whether regressive or progressive, have the power to reshape social institutions in the realm of societal relations through processes such as rationalization, regulation, standardization, institutionalization, subjectification, interpolation, and engineering consent. A modular definition of capital extends the scope of analysis beyond exploitative production relations. The so-called productive capital, when seen from this perspective, includes not only the reification of, more than, human creative power but also the fetishizing infraprocesses, which counterfeit true value by manufacturing meaning, motivation, and consent in a world fast emptied of, non-capitalist, visions and true self-value. Fetishization complements reification in decommonizing human creative, convivial caring, and prefigurative capacities for living in balance with their commoning sources of livability and thereby helps normalize the networks of capital's power. However, as capital cannot reach absolute supremacy due to the contradictions built into its inner workings, this results in greater dysfunctionality in the works of socio-ecological commons. Since the crises cannot be effectively managed despite orchestrating mass deceptions and delusions, capital creates more chaos, public angst, and popular dissatisfaction. Civilizing mechanisms as negative feedback loops, activated by social democratic, radical populist, and a range of movements in between, come into play, and their diluted versions become co-opted when conflicts over the socialization of the costs of the reproduction of labor, as the reified form of human creative power alienated from its commoning origin, pose challenges to the system. The policies and practices associated with the civilizing process are constantly influenced by internal conflicts within the capitalist class, particularly among different factions that mobilize their social bases through elections or exert their power through plutocratic influences. Additionally, inter-class conflicts arise between the subaltern class and the capitalist class, further shaping the dynamics of the civilizing process. The contention of the latter type is typically mediated, for example, via liberal democratic and collective bargaining apparatuses. When this type of contention fails to deliver due to being weakened, since capital's supremacy consumes the lower and working classes in their struggles for redistributive social justice, 
the regressive civilizing forces gain greater momentum. Those factions of the capitalist class that benefit from regressive civilizing mechanisms as well as the factions of working and lower classes with a strong sense of resentment and fear, make a clientelist alliance against the other factions of the capitalist and working classes, Hosseini et al. 2022. The decommunizing and civilizing meta-processes are both complementary and contradictory to one another, creating a bipartite epicenter comprised of the major forces of center-right and center-left in the politics of capital. Fragile political stability is normally, albeit temporarily, achieved when the contradictory and complementary relations between the two meta-processes reach equilibrium. The center is, however, not static, as the political forces of the two sides can regain their momentum alternatively through economic cycles of growth versus spending, recession versus inflation, and globalization versus deglobalization. There is no pure or perfect state of capitalism. This partiality, imperfection is the product of its inner contradictions and the contradictions it has in its relationship with domains of life that stay out of its full domination. This is both advantageous and disadvantageous from an anti-capitalist point of view. It allows for change but also creates crises and renders capital with unparalleled self-serving dynamism and flexibility. Besides the civilizing ones, there are always resisting and transformational forces and mechanisms in place. Ideally, the counter and post-capital mechanisms work in the opposite direction to decommunization, i.e., in the direction of converting fetish value back to true value and or generating and circulating true value out of fundamental commoning sources. However, many such forces do not negate capital in its entirety. In the real world, the relationship between capital and counter-capital is not dualistic. Many transformative forces become willingly or unwillingly absorbed into the civilizing processes or continue to coexist symbiotically alongside capital in isolated niches until they lose their potency to survive due to capital's infiltration or their internal exhaustion. The circulation of true value can be interrupted at any moment by capital and diverted into fetish value production. Figure 4.2 portrays the generation of true value through the counter and post-capitalist meta-processes of value generation thus demarcating it only analytically from the fetish value construction in figure 4.1. There are two ideal type processes in place, which not only resist the decommunization trends but also function to transform the capitalist social formation by, one, restoring true value through converting capital back into fundamental commons, decapitalization or more broadly re-commonizing, such as via community wealth mobilizations and workplace democracy, and or preserving and protecting the existing commons against the threats of capital through resistance, disruption, and protest, and, two, originating true value out of the fundamental commons through the generation of what we call common graces, which are the objective manifestations of true value in the form of enhanced qualities of living together and improved capabilities to thrive, inclusive of non-human beings, see figure 4.2 and table 4.1. Figure 4.2 displays the true value generation processes, restorative and originative. The true value generating infra processes can be ideal typically divided into two major types. 1. The re-commonization infra process, which comprises three restorative types of meta-mechanisms. 1. Defetishizing meta-mechanisms that delegitimize the irrational incorporeal values of capitalist relations and reinforce communal bonds and solidarity and construct liberation ethics and utopian visions. The defetishization process is highly pluralistic and heterodox, and it reinforces transformative resistance through the promotion of more participation, autonomy, and diversity. However, it also paradoxically ramifies and disorients transformative forces. 2. De-reifying meta-mechanisms, which are persistent actions that aim to resist or reverse capital's reification infra-process by restoring the lost subjectivity of the objectified sources of true value. Examples include de-commodifying, de-institutionalizing, and de-rationalizing praxis. 3. Reclaiming meta-mechanisms and their associated praxis are those that de-appropriate and liberate sources of value. Examples include de-privatization, nationalizing natural resources, occupying to reclaim public spaces, decommercialization, reclaiming common goods, reclaiming the management and ownership of workplaces, the socialization of ownership, the democratization of economic spheres, restoring of commons, and the decolonization of social relationships and knowledge. 2. 
the originative post-capitalist meta-mechanisms of the commonization infra process shift the way true value is generated by giving primacy to the preservation and regenerativity of fundamental commons and their integrity in the generation of common graces within the socio-ecological boundaries of the commons. The restorative and originative praxis are interdependent. One cannot fully achieve its goals without the other one, Gills and Hosseini, 2022. A communist perspective requires us to explicitly distinguish the key infraprocesses that constitute capital through interacting, interfacing, and contradicting one another. This cannot be complete without the consideration of social praxis and processes that are in constant tension with capital. The result will be a modular kit of distinct concepts that represent these independent but interrelated identifiable building blocks, as portrayed in figures 4.1 and 4.2 and as summed up in table 4.1. As per the above modular approach, capital can be briefly defined as follows. Capital is both the product and the infra process of perverting the fundamental causes of true value into the causes of fetish value. As the product, it is the corporeal manifestation of fetish value, and as the infra process, it is essentially the abstraction and appropriation of fundamental commons. Table 4.1 below describes capital as a modular, infra processual conception made up of. 1. Decommunization, CF, Figure 4.1. 1. Reification infra process, central to decommunization, objectifies commons capacities so they can be appropriated and transformed into capital. This necessitates the emergence of meta mechanisms that may commodify, commercialize, and or financialize social relations. 2. Fetishization infra process, central to decommunization, is essential for the construction of fetish value and not only its legitimization as value but also for placing it as a final cause of value production. Some key meta-mechanisms that work in association with this infra-process are modern anthropomorphizing, psychologizing, and sanctifying mechanisms. 3. Appropriation infra-process, central to decommunization, includes legal and policy procedures that regulate ownership, such as property rights, corporatization, and privatization but also those that regulate risk-taking, rent-seeking, betting, profiting, seizing, enclosure, and control over the flows of capital and its accumulation in favor of the capitalist class. 2. Civilizing meta-mechanisms, as negative feedback loops to decommunization, address uncertainty in the system and work toward equilibrium and stability through several meta-mechanisms at the cost of softening and thus to accelerating decommunization. These meta-mechanisms include rationalization, economic regulations, standardization, and institutionalization, such as unionization. 3. The central meta-mechanisms of the communist infra-process of true value generation, CF, figure 4.2. 1. Reclaiming meta-mechanisms, central to the restorative meta-processes of recommunization and complementary to defetishization and dereification, to appropriate and liberate sources of value. Examples are deprivatization, decommercialization, reclaiming common goods, the socialization of ownership, the democratization of economic spheres, restoring commons, and decolonization. 2. Defetishizing meta-mechanisms, central to the restorative meta-processes of recommunization and complementary to dereification and reclaiming, delegitimize fetish value and unveil its negative function. Examples are movements that strive to challenge and change the value system by questioning the primacy of wealth or economic growth as a social value. 3. De reifying meta mechanisms, central to the restorative meta processes of recommunization and complementary to de fetishization and reclaiming commons, include praxis like de objectification and de commodification. 4. Originative post capitalist meta mechanisms, central to the commonization infra process place the alterity of good life as the final cause and, thereby, shift the way true value is re-generated by giving primacy to the preservation and regeneration of fundamental commons and their integrity. End of Table 4.1 Capital functions to re-construct, sustain, and extend manipulative, exploitative, extractivist, and domineering, mead, power structures that, in turn, uphold its supremacy as a value regime, Figure 4.3 it is socially and historically constructed through the decommunization process, which involves the reification, fetishization, and appropriation of commons. The civilizing meta-mechanisms act as a stabilizing factor in a negative feedback loop, figure 4.1.
capitalist society is characterized by constant interaction between capital and various transformative forces that operate through restorative re-commonizing meta-mechanisms of dereification, defetishization, and reclaiming meta-mechanisms, as well as originative post-capitalist meta-mechanisms that generate true value out of and back into fundamental commons, figure 4.2. From the organic configuration of commoning sources of true value to the mechanical architecture of capital. The relationships among the fundamental commoning sources of true value in the commonest state of living are characterized by their organic nature. These relationships transcend boundaries, functions, and hierarchies, facilitating decentralized flows of care, influence, and information. These commoning sources constitute a higher commons, the life domain in commonest living, functioning like organs within an organism, drawing their vitality from collective wholeness. Under capitalism, the organic interconnections among these fundamental value sources give way to mechanistic relationships. They become compartmentalized into socio-economic, socio-ecological, socio-cultural, and socio-political categories governed by mechanical interactions. Flows of fetish value, standardized with normative power, in their major forms, economic, political, social, and ecological, are controlled by the capitalist state, big business, and finance. Figure 4.3 combines figures 3.1, 4.1, and 4.2 to illustrate the perversion of the organically interrelated four fundamental causes of true value into the compartmentalized architecture of capital consisting of the four spheres of capitalist society with mechanistic relations among them. To acknowledge that capitalist production relies not just on the exploitation of labor, but also on the expropriation of nature, social reproduction, and political prerequisites, may sound like a revelation for those who have been immersed in reductionist neoclassical economics and orthodox productivist Marxism. However, this argument still relies on these ideologically constructed bourgeois categories that normalize the alienated forms of originally commoning sources of true value. The concept of nature is an ideological construct that portrays reified and fetishized sources of livability, disconnected from human labor. In reality, the life domain or what is commonly referred to as nature, actively engages in creative work by continuously actualizing the potential for self-realization. Moreover, Human labor power emanated from the human body is nurtured by the rest of life domain and becomes an active part of it. Reluctantly employing these reductionist terms, it is the surplus labor of the so-called nature, quantitatively, the energy matter extracted per unit of natural resources within a given time frame beyond the ecological requirements for the sustenance, regeneration, and flourishing of ecosystems, that serves as a material cause in the generation of fetish value. Figure 4.3 displays the mechanical architecture of capital versus the organic configuration of the commonest state of living. Fetish value within the capitalist framework cannot arise solely from any individual fundamental commoning source without the perversion of the other three indispensable commons to create the necessary conditions for its generation. As discussed in Chapter 2, the indispensable commoning sources, despite their differences regarding their Aristotelian causal relations with value, are deeply intertwined. Therefore, the decommonization of each fundamental commons is associated with the peripheralization or annexation of other commons to the required degree. Annexation occurs within the constantly shifting frontiers of capital, where the decommonization and appropriation of true value sources take place. It signifies the encroachment of capital into non-commodified zones of commoning, whereby self-regenerating activities outside of capitalist relations are assimilated and integrated into the capitalist framework. This annexation is a crucial aspect of the colonialist nature of capital, as it entails the absorption and control of diverse commoning ways of living to varying degrees, contributing to the ongoing decommonization process. Creativity in Capitality The innate creativity of humanity constitutes a vital commons that generates true value in a commonest state of living. However, in the context of capitalist relations, this creative force is transformed into labor through the infraprocess of decommonization. Consequently, labor is stripped of its subjective nature, becoming a material cause or substance of capitalist value. This loss of subjectivity is due to the alienation of labor from its original commoning nature as human creativity, which should be in organic harmony with the sources of extra human creativity, livability, conviviality, and alterity that exist within a commoning status, refer to chapter 5 for a detailed discussion of this argument. 
only when the focus of our analysis is on the decommonization of one of the fundamental causes of true value, e.g., creative power, should we examine the other three fundamental sources of true value in terms of the capitalist meta-mechanisms that turn them into the conditions of possibility, or the peripheral necessity for the primary source of value in question. In the process of extracting value out of the work of the so-called nature via algorithms and machines with the involvement of an apparently negligible amount of human labor, the latter, peripheralization of labor, becomes a condition of possibility for the former, exploitation of nature. Take, for example, Bitcoin mining and pooling, where minimal living labor, for servicing, maintaining, and upgrading the machinery, is involved directly in the production of this financial digital asset. The production of Bitcoin relies heavily on energy consumption in processing vast amounts of data, resulting in significant environmental impacts. The primary commons that are being directly decommonized are the natural and energy resources being consumed in the process of mining. The dead labor involved in producing the necessary machines, material infrastructure, and energy resources is also expropriated, meaning that its value is appropriated without providing compensation or recognition for the laborer. The status of this expropriated labor is similar to the status of unrecognized, unwaged expropriated domestic labor in classical industrial systems. The labor directly involved in solving the hash function and providing the proof of work is not directly exploited either, rather, it plays a regulatory role. Within the strict and automatized confines of the Bitcoin algorithm, abstract labor becomes the mechanism of control, through the verification of transactions, and, consequently, its source of value. The central authority is replaced by abstract labor as the technology of imminent control. Tremchinsky, 2022, page 32. The value produced through Bitcoin mining ultimately derives from the labor involved in its production, but the laborer involved is not directly exploited in the same way as classical industrial laborers. This peripheralization of labor can be seen as a form of reification of labor without its commodification, in which labor loses its subjectivity as an efficient cause by being reduced to a secondary material cause. Fetishization occurs when an object is given subjective qualities or characteristics, such as value, power, or agency, that are actually derived from social relations and practices. In the case of Bitcoin, the rhetoric around its decentralization and potential to liberate us from government surveillance is a way of fetishizing the technology. By attributing to Bitcoin qualities such as decentralization, freedom, and security, the discourse surrounding the technology presents it as a powerful and transformative force. This fetishization of Bitcoin serves to obscure the social and political dimensions of the technology and to present it as a neutral and apolitical tool that can be used to achieve a range of goals. This can make it more difficult to critically assess the impacts of the technology and to identify the interests and power relations that are at play. Livability in Capitality Capital fragments the life domain by decommonizing its sources of livability, resulting in the alienation of human creativity from its commoning nature. Capital responds to the malaise it creates by enlarging the chasms between social spheres, which further reproduces capital, without solving socio-ecological crises. Capital fetishizes reified and dispossessed commons, selling them as solutions to alienation. These include the well-being and self-help industry, alternative medicine, anti-aging science, and ecotourism, which only exacerbate capitalist remedies for alienation, Davies, 2015, Hosseini, 2018b, Hosseini, 2021. Nature is the result of the fetishization of livability sources, becoming an object ready for appropriation. The perversion of livability into fetishized nature leaves less capacity for decommonization and capitals, cures, are augmentative but narcotic based upon enchantment. This leads to increased costs and the unaffordability of alternatives. Conviviality in capitality. Meaningful lives, in a communist state of living, are created when human beings autonomously explore, experience, and reflect on the totality and ultimacies of their relationships with, within their own selves with one another, with history, society, life, and existence. The lack of conviviality in reified social domains, under capital, reduces individuals and communities to bearers of capitalist value, resulting in emptiness, repetitiveness, and uncertainty. Capital is not only anti-social but also paradoxically alters societal modes of livelihood, creating demand for a more meaningful life among alienated individuals. As part of its self-civilizing mechanisms, 
Capitalism capitalizes on identity crises and alienation not only by fetishizing consumerism as a way of promoting sociability but also by offering a fetishized sphere of coexistence, such as digital communication platforms and cryptocurrencies, that extract more capitalist and fetish value. Fetishization accelerates capital's growth but also exacerbates its intrinsic crisis tendencies, leading to greater social disparities, ecological crises, and financial turbulences. To ensure its continuity, capital relies on the decommunization of social reproduction, making it imperative to unite class struggles with liberatory efforts within the realm of social reproduction for true liberation. Alterity in Capitality In a communist state of becoming, the future is one of the foundational commons of all possibilities that everyone contributes to, not owned or controlled by anyone. It is a source of alterity, the final cause of true value. But when capital interferes, the future becomes objectified and fetishized as the bearer of ultimate value production, rather than a collective effort toward new possibilities. As essential commons diminish, the process of constructing new commons becomes lengthier and more demanding, contributing to a deficit in true value. For example, the value of endeavors and the consequences of inaction in addressing the global ecological crisis should be subtracted from the capitalist value produced, considering the detrimental effects it has on the environment. See Note 2. Capital decommonizes the future by narrowing the scope for alterity, even colonizing the future by turning future work into a commodity. Financial and monetary measures determined undemocratically play a significant role in this process. Capital strikes and hoardings prevent democratic determination and limit opportunities for social progress, undermining democratic decision-making. The labor of the future encompasses essential socio-political actions aimed at mitigating the negative impacts of capitalist value production on self-sustaining organized life. The erosion of fundamental commons leads to a deficit between capitalist value and true value, necessitating a higher amount of true value to recommonize capitalist relations and protect existing commons metaphorical arithmetic of capital. The application of our framework to reconstructing the Marxian value theory requires two major steps. One, differentiating between fetish value and capitalist value by incorporating the true value lost to the process of decommunization and, two, expanding the definition of capitalist value beyond the abstract labor of commodity producers to include the work emanating from the other three reified forms of fundamental commons. The expropriated work of so-called nature, community, especially social reproductive labor relations, and the work of capital's political organization, see note 3. Although arithmetic representations of the theory may risk oversimplification, they can be valuable tools for illustrating the proportions and relationships between the heterogeneous components of value creation under capital in a simplified manner. In the communist state of living, characterized by the regenerative mechanism of organized life and its ability to counteract entropy, True value experiences a surplus that extends over a significant span of geological time. This surplus value is a result of the sustainable and harmonious interactions within the ecosystem, where the regeneration and preservation of true value are prioritized. Surplus true value under the commonest state of living equals true value produced minus true value consumed by the sources of value minus true value lost to entropy plus or minus external factors or influences greater than zero. The surplus true value generated can have various implications for the extension, flourishing of life, long-term sustainability, and addressing disparities among and inside the ecosystems. Surplus true value is utilized to counteract entropy and maintain vitality, prioritizing a self-sustaining status, rather than infinite growth. Under capitalism, true value is in an exponentially growing deficit, due to an increase in the rate of decommunization of the four fundamental causes of true value. Deficit true value under capital equals true value produced inside and outside capitalist production relations minus true value consumed and expropriated by capital minus true value lost to entropy minus potential communist true value lost to. Capitalist decommunization less than zero true value can manifest within capitalist socio-ecological relations while operating outside the confines of productive capital. This can be observed in non-capitalist social and ecological reproductive activities, as well as in politically and future-oriented activism aimed at fostering communal well-being. Moreover, true value can also arise within capitalist production relations, such as when workers in a privately owned firm provide mutual care and support during challenging times or in their collective struggles for improved working conditions. 
In both instances, this true value is typically directed toward the reproduction and subsistence of the sources of capitalist value, such as labor, in order to compensate for the deficiencies inherent in capital's allocation, e.g., insufficient wages. Capital itself tends to return value solely for the reproduction of these sources as expendable entities, e.g., labor qua labor. However, these non-transformative types of true value are ultimately subsumed into capitalist value production if they do not lead to any lasting weakening or replacement of capitalist relations. The true value that could have been produced prior to capitalist decommunization represents the potential communist true value lost in the equation. When fundamental sources of true value are decommunized by capital, acknowledging the diminished potential for creating such value is crucial, even if quantifying its magnitude is challenging. Fetish value is the product of interaction between the inner and outer organization of capital. The outer organization of capital is the constantly shifting frontiers of capital where the annexation and decommunization of the sources of true value occurs, whereas the inner structure of capital is where the already decommunized sources of value are incorporated into the capitalist process of extracting capitalist surplus value, see figure 4.4. As capital grows through decommunization, the magnitude of the true value lost in the outer organization of capital becomes greater than the magnitude of the capitalist value produced inside the inner organization, leading to a growingly negative magnitude of fetish value. Fetish value equals aggregate capitalist value minus capitalist value expended on the regeneration of the sources of capitalist value plus deficit true value under capital. Or fetish value equals aggregate capitalist value minus capitalist value expended on the regeneration of decommunized sources of capitalist value plus true value produced inside the capitalist production relations plus true value produced outside the capitalist production relations resulting in the endurance of existing commons subject to decommunization minus true value consumed and expropriated by capital true value lost to entropy minus potential communist true value lost to decommunization the first three components within the first pair of brackets in the equation above constitute the net surplus capitalist value, and occur within the capitalist relations, including the inner structure of productive capital. Surplus capitalist value is then the difference between the aggregate capitalist value produced, and the capitalist value expended to regenerate its decommunized sources of value, which are alienated labor, nature, social reproduction, and capital's political organization. The second pair of brackets denotes the net deficit in true value, which is a negative quantity significantly larger than the first component and has been growing. Figure 4.4 shows the inner and outer organizations of capital, inside and outside capitalist relations. Surplus capitalist value equals aggregate capitalist value minus capitalist value expended on the regeneration of the sources of capitalist value plus true value produced inside the capitalist relations, but outside capitalist production relations. See note 4. Originally, according to Marx, surplus value is the commodity value, originated from surplus labor. It is thus. Surplus, commodity, value equals aggregate commodity value produced by labor minus value of labor power. See note 5. Or in other words, surplus labor time equals aggregate socially necessary labor time minus paid labor time. See notes 6 and 7. Through the second step, the definition of value will be expanded beyond surplus labor to incorporate the works of uncommodified spheres of value production. The surplus capitalist value is the sum of all surpluses extracted out of the reified forms of the four fundamental causes of value. Surplus capitalist value equals aggregate capitalist value minus capitalist value expended on the regeneration of the sources of capitalist value equals surplus value extracted from labor plus surplus value extracted from nature plus surplus value extracted from social reproduction plus surplus value extracted from political organization. Surplus commodity value extracted from labor equals total human labor power expended minus capitalist value expended on labor's reproduction. Surplus capitalist ecological value extracted from ecosystems equals total ecosystem services, are nature's work, minus capitalist value expended on maintaining, sustaining, and rehabilitating these services. Surplus capitalist social value extracted from social reproduction equals total work of social reproduction resulting in the reproduction of labor and addressing the social, ecological, and political externalities of capital minus capitalist value expended on the regeneration of social reproduction. 
surplus capitalist political value extracted from political organization equals total organizational work increasing aggregate capitalist value minus capitalist value expended on the political organization of capital. The scope of this volume does not allow for the comprehensive exploration of all major aspects of capitalist and communist modes of value production using the modular framework developed here. That would require us to show how, under capital, the potential for the generation of true value out of and for each commons is distorted, how fetish value is instead constructed, how the localized, regionalized fetish value regimes, in turn, accelerate the decommunization process, how contentious stability is injected through civilizing meta-mechanisms, and how transformative praxis are possible and at work to restore and originate true value while displaying their complex, non-dualist, relationships with capital. However, the next two chapters will begin this exploration by revisiting the Marxian labor theory of value and proposing ways to reconstruct it from the perspective of the communist framework. Through engagement with post-Marxist and Marxian revisionist arguments, these chapters offer a platform to delve into the intricate and abstract concepts introduced earlier. Notes on Chapter 4. 1. The differences between primary abstraction and secondary abstraction are delineated in more details in the next chapter. See also Hosseini, 2022b. 2. The costs of climate inaction continue to grow exponentially. The slower and more inadequate the measures, the more burdensome they become. Numerous scientific reports, including the Stern Review in 2006 and the more recent IPCC reports, confirm that the costs of inaction on climate change are projected to be significantly higher than the costs of action. 3. Capital's political organization, or power structure, as the bearer of capital's final cause, is the diffuse and pervasive force that regulates and structures social relations and economic systems in a way that privileges the interests of capital over other social and ecological concerns. This power operates through enchantment, e.g., the production and dissemination of knowledge, desires, norms, and ideologies that naturalize capitalist relations and structures, and make alternatives appear impossible or undesirable. 4. Examples of this are the reproductive work executed to sustain labor or the communal works expanded to addresses the ecological or social externalities of capital. 5. The value of labor power is the labor time socially necessary to produce the means of subsistence of workers, as workers. 6. Expended in the production of commodities. 7. Socially necessary to produce means of labor substance, as determined by competition in the labor market and through the private exchange of means of subsistence of value producers.